Okay, um, I'm going to ask two questions to warm up the panel first. Uh, one's an easy one, and the other one's going to be a toughie. And then anything else in between, you guys can cover because they have already answered the ask hard questions. So the first question now, um, Long Kai talks about um, interest-driven and interest being quite an important part of innovation. So among the four of you, for each of you, um, why did you do the research that led to your presentation? So that's my interest. <laughs> so, I, uh, so what brought me to me is about the I, I, I think now the it's really talking about the formal learning and informal learning, okay? Because we have done, have, uh, in our economics, have done a lot of um, formal learning, and uh, informal learning is still a quite uh, unexplored uh, space. And uh, I think in when we talk about informal learning, the interest really plays an important part. So I think if we want to. So as AI researchers, I think this is a part AI researchers can help uh, with the teachers, can help with the schools. So that, I think that's the driving force I, I have. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Lokar. Um, in my case, as I said, I kind of uh, serendipitously stumbled upon the makerspace. Um, and it was primarily because um, the students that I had already been working with uh, on other projects um, um, saw so, so it fit to share their, 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 their peripheral, what they considered peripheral work with me. Um, more generally, I think my interests in uh, maker culture started um, around the, um, around, say around 2011, 2012, when um, when I think it was increasingly recognized that that the dispositions around making, modding, and if I may use the word uh, hacking, um, are indeed very aligned with some of the so-called 21st century dispositions that uh, our education system in as a whole seeks to nurture. So back to my point. Um, I think a lot of the dispositions are already happening in schools. It's just that we need to um, broaden our eyes to learn to recognize them, even though they may be in unlikely places. So I, I guess for me, uh, you know, my 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 sort of rejoinder is like, you know, why? I mean, you know, my personal interest in in, in this uh, is a bit irrelevant. I think it's a grand challenge. Uh, uh, it's 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 amazing. Uh, it's we we find ourselves at a time where you know we realize that you know we, we need to do certain things in order to you know perpetuate our level of success and stuff like that. And I think like you know it requires us to reimagine what society ought to be like. Uh, if we do that, right? I mean, you know, one of the things that you know come forward is like you know how do we do it? Uh, as I see it, as I mean, my perspective from my point of view is that I mean, you know, one of the best ways to get at it is uh, from a design perspective. Uh, and for the reasons that I mentioned in the in the in my presentation, I mean the the, the way that design is uh, you know deliberately transdisciplinary that requires the best of like you know STEM and you know aesthetics philosophy and you know humanities and stuff like that. It's something that you know is a grand challenge that you know that of all times. It's it's not it's nothing to do with you know me uh, so much as it's it's an it's opportune. <coughs> uh, it's something that just we have to do, or else. Uh, I guess do you ever feel that, you know, life kind of starts and then you make a full circle and things return? Um, okay, just, I mean, I always used to love to hang out at libraries. So, you know, that's what I meant by that strange statement. And, you know, now my work is on libraries, but actually my research is on, was on literature and reading. Uh, and I think uh, essentially I'm focusing on this because I feel that this is an area where I can make visible change and that if I work with, um, in my research, and if I work with MOE, and if I work with NLB, and we do something to change the library spaces, I do believe that it can be of some sort of benefit to students who come from low-income homes. I mean, ultimately, I think that, you know, education needs to be equitable. 
uh, and that's my way of working at it being equitable. Okay, thank you. Um, talking about life and full circles, uh, for those of you who might be around my age, you know, in the <laughs> early 80s, you might remember metal work or woodwork, you know, that we have to do. And we have to construct something, make something. Um, and the one that I always remember that was a doorstop, a wooden doorstop. I had no choice in terms of what I had to choose. Uh, I have to make the doorstop and I have to make it in a very specific dimension or I'll fail the course, right? But yet, when you talk about making and innovation here, the keywords that keep popping up, things like autonomy, interest, designing spaces, transgression, inter interdisciplinarity, celebrating failure, imagination, all those words are almost alien in, in our current educational climate. Would you agree with that? Or like what Kenneth say, you know, it's, it's, there are good things happening in, in schools, maybe in an informal context, um, but not maybe in a formal context. You know, I tried this once. I said something similar, and uh, I got into a lot of trouble. No, it, it, it's, it's, that's not the way uh, uh, school is. Uh, I mean, like, uh, DNT is, uh, you know, I mean, okay, I'm in a project that uh, looks at, you know, 10 DNT schools. I mean, 10 schools. Uh, and we're out to, you know, disrupt, hack, actually, you know, at the uh, DNT curriculum and pedagogy. Uh, and by hack, I don't mean, you know, nefarious concepts. <coughs> hack, in the original term, in used in the uh, 40s, 50s, when computer scientists, uh, took like room size computers and made it do like you know crazy things that it wasn't initially in intended to, to do like play music which is the reason why your iPhone that right now can play music by the way anyway so we were there hacking at the DNT curriculum and pedagogy uh, one of the things that we did initially we came in with this idea that oh well you know it's uh, it's still you know doing that kind of thing a lot of, a lot has changed um, but there is still some a, a lot more that needs to be done so I, I won't say that you know it's, it's still uh, follow the instructions or you fail. Uh, there is a strong design element, but it can be further strengthened. Yeah, uh, I'm uh, Su Chin from CPD. I think it's correct. Okay. Uh, I oversee DNT education at MOHQ. All right. What you described was uh, work work in the early 80s. Today, the subject is non-existent because Singapore has moved. Uh, uh, has moved on. So what we have today is a uh, design and technology as uh, described by Michael. <coughs> All right. Um, when Dr. Wu was talking about informal learning space, I was just thinking, is it not possible for informal learning space to exist in formal curriculum? And the answer is yes, in a DNT classroom. All right. In a DNT classroom, kids are allowed. Um, um, kids can still do well in a national examination even though they come up with a solution that did not work at all. All right, there, there was one case whereby a kid designed a huge coral out of a large diameter PVC pipe, thinking that he just plunged this thing into the ground. <coughs> he can pull out a core of earth and immediately plant a young uh, 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 plant. All right, of course the solution didn't work. But at the end of the day, he still get a distinction in DNT at national at all level. Okay, simply because he has got, he, he, he managed to, he went through a, a deep design thinking process. All right, so in today's context, this kind of informal learning, okay, highly driven by kids' interests, do exist in the formal school curriculum. All right, and, and um, yeah, it is a situation <coughs> today. And uh, if you are keen to take a look, a little advertisement time, okay, if you are keen to take a look at what DNT kids can design and make, we have a public exhibition next week, and if you are interested in the details, you can get the details from Michael or Alright, thank you very much. So yeah, assessment is a question. I know Michael raised it. When we talk about uh, you know, all of these hyper spaces, um, I would like to hear examples of how all of these students were assessed and how uh, you know their outputs were sort of uh, viewed uh, from a uh, non-score background, because uh, I'm looking at some of the Vietnamese data now, and one is uh, in the reform process. People are talking about how 
you know, a primary school, there is some moving away from the traditional assessment that's happening, and teachers are getting paranoid over the process uh, because of training and uh, because of you know a not a unified approach and the lack of ability to handle you uh, know in the classroom. Uh, my second question, so I'll throw to uh, anyone can pick up. Next one is. Uh, <coughs> What is the hacking or tinkering happening at the teacher education level? Because definitely teachers have a role to, happen, uh, to make there. They are part of this maker space, whether they are behind the scene or part of the group. And you know, uh, uh, we, we heard about the assistance that you were talking about in the library. I think that there's more facilitation required, and uh, that requires some of uh, you know co-learning in the process and completely things break down, you know, who's there to, to get them out of space or the teacher may not know. So how are they prepared from the teacher education perspective? And, and lastly, where do experts, industry <coughs> experts or work like people come? Because all of this design and technology, everything is tied to future skills and future workforce or something that goes out of the window into the real life. You can innovate, you fail 80 times. <coughs> Next time, you know, Steve Jobs have got a product into the market. So how are we bringing those so-called, uh, you know, the, the other side into this space, whether to hack the curriculum or whether to hack anything? Uh, and where is that learning happening? It, it's a lot of... So you have three questions there, right? <laughs> so the first one, uh, you answer. <coughs> Um, I can answer the second. Uh, no, I, I just like go ramble around. Uh, so one of the one of the things that happened before was uh, I, I spoke to a group of um, uh, LEP trainees. Uh, these are uh, principal trainees, and so one of the questions that came uh, is very similar to yours. Is like, how do we find teachers like this to you know uh, to lead uh, maker spaces? Uh, at that point in time, uh, you know we didn't really have a, a teacher education program component that you know had this kind of disposition. Uh, uh, like front and center. This is kind of like you know. Uh, uh, so and and you know, I, I remember thinking at the point in time, I was like, it's it's hard. It's very hard because uh, you know you you need uh, uh, people or uh, teachers who can model the risk taking dispositions. Uh, in fact, the one or two teachers that I worked with, you met, uh, you quit the system. Um, you know, part of the reason. My days are Okay, so. Um, yeah, they, they, they left the service. Um, okay, so uh, it's in terms of teacher development, I think it's 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 very hard to uh, nurture somebody at you know the stage where of like uh, at the at, at pre late stage when when I mean I think you know what what needs to be done is that you know from a very early stage from even from like primary school uh, we need to like stop insisting that. You know, we have a vision for tomorrow. If you remember 1984 or something like that, we have a vision for tomorrow. Just believe, just believe. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that happens to be like you know, uh, uh, everything is everything is well planned. Everything is well shared. I mean, w where where do we give opportunities for uh, you know students to come up with their own plans, their own initiatives, their own ideas? Um, where? I mean. We know, I mean, we have a, a solution. Manucha uh, tells us it's DNT. But I think it needs to be more than that. It needs, it cannot be just one subject and you know, only one and a half hours <coughs> a week you are allowed to become creative. Every other time, you know, listen to us, we have a vision for tomorrow. So as for the assessment part, I think uh, um, most, of, most of what we've seen so far uh, is, is based in like, you know, design te technology. Uh, it's portfolio-based assessment. Uh, we've been advocating for a different way of approaching assessment because uh, the end product uh, is not exactly necessarily going to be a, a good enough measure for success because it's the, the journey, the process in, in which you take to get to the final product and the product could actually be a failure yet you have traveled you know, multiple iterations, multiple, um, multiple prototypes that have, have like, you know, demonstrated your, your effort in the process uh, that needs to be rewarded for. Um, okay, uh, I just uh, add a little bit to it. I think I agree with Michael. It's about disposition building. And it's hard to build a disposition, you know, without giving time and space uh, for it to grow. But I want to respond to the answer about what the teachers are doing. Uh, not so much at NIE, but my own opinion as to what teachers need to become the kinds of specialists uh, at hacking. 
Um, in my own research, in another research study that I did with Warren Mark Liu on teacher education, and specifically English teachers, one of the things we found is that our teachers have no <coughs> surprise. Because um, <laughs> they spend a lot of time marking and doing stuff, and particularly for the younger teachers, they're very stressed out because they're adjusting to a lot of new things, and they spend a lot of time doing um, marking, curriculum planning, and um, it may be that, you know, when I was a student, teachers didn't have to do so much, so they had a lot more extra time. But right now, really, the onus is on teachers to be curriculum planners, as well as markers, as well as CCA teachers. So teachers are doing a lot of time. So my answer is sort of that we need to give teachers time to hack. I, I know, but uh, some teachers will slack, right? So that's the problem. Then you say, okay, you know, some teachers hack, some teachers slack. So we can't account for those who slack, so we make everybody do the same amount of work. But I do think that uh, we need to give teachers time, uh, that sort of space for thinking. I know there is space that's being built in, but I still feel that it's insufficient. You know, as an English teacher, um, you know, doing things with the girls, putting up plays that were not part of the curriculum. When I was teaching in RGS, my girls said, we want to put out a play. Okay, let's rewrite Romeo and Juliet, and we did it. And it took a lot of work on the teacher's part, but I was single, I was unmarried, I had no kids, and so I could stay at school very late. Uh, now I can't. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is, I suppose, um, the idea of the specialist. In my work on school libraries, at least, uh, one of the things that I'm advocating is that maybe we need teacher librarians, which are not the standard in the Singapore context. But the teacher librarian is somebody who's got a degree or diploma who is trained to manage the library, not just as a librarian, but as a teacher. So, you know, they may plan uh, information literacy lessons. I want to, as a history teacher, maybe I may go in and say, I want to do a history on war. Can you help me to find the materials for it and see if our school has it and come up with all the resources that my students can use to do a research on it? So that would be the role of teacher librarians. And I wonder if thinking about what kind of uh, roles we need to create for people who are still teachers, but they may not actually be in the classroom, uh, will help. And I think, you know, for the other sorts of informal learning, you know, um, the idea of having a teacher who's just hanging around to help anybody who wants to do anything, is there a possibility for that kind of manpower in our school? Um, okay, so if you, actually there, there's a coda to the story that I, I, <laughs> I shared. Um, the coda is not necessarily, um, yeah, it's kind of a, it's, a, it's a very bittersweet story. Uh, I already hinted that uh, the one of the protagonists of the story, Joel, is uh, who 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 was displaying very promising hacker, um, was displaying very promising maker dispositions. Uh, is uh, trying to get into into NID as a teacher, um, and he's going through the application process. And here I'm addressing someone directly. <laughs> 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 But there's as a wider as a wider context, as a wider context, um, re with regards um, how teachers evaluate and assess uh, what's going on when they see such dispositions and whether um, actually, you know, the philosophical conundrum of um, Schrodinger's cat: is the cat alive or is the cat dead? Um, okay, I see a blank face. Yes. Okay, never mind. Okay, basically what happened was, once I brought the attention, uh, once I brought, once I brought the maker space to the attention of the school leadership, um, and then, to, uh, in addition to the uh, school's middle management, and specifically to the teachers in charge of the NCC and CCA, they were actually quite horrified um, because to them, the children were doing things which were not core to the NCC air curriculum. And they actually, um, actually they shut it down. Uh. So it's very sad. Um, the irony is that the NCC air commandant, who was like the overall in charge of the whole NCC air in Singapore, um, did recognize what was going on and did recognize the power of, of, of their learning and the transdisciplinary learning. Um, but he was unable to help the school um, understand the benefits of that 
So I think there's a lot of there's a lot we can learn. Um, yeah, in terms of that's why I always talk about the tension. I talked about the tension between the the creativity <coughs> versus the rigor, and I think how we manage that tension and how we mediate these um, these opportunities uh, is really going to is really the key as to how we proceed forward. Um, so that we do have a vision for tomorrow. Uh, it's just that the vision for tomorrow is a slightly more widened one. So to me, it's, it's kind of a story about when the interest been with the school. So because as we have interviewed with some students, I think we have a, a, a local secondary school, and uh, we have interviewed with, with students with, with extremely high interest in coding. Okay, but that school, that school is, is actually has developed certain programs in coding. Okay, and uh, in that case, we can see the students are really happy because they're happy they can, they can collabor collaborate with others, they can, they can have, they can still have guidance with, uh, from the teachers. So that's a, that's to, to, to me it's a sweet spot. Okay, that, so that's a case when the, when the, when the, when their special interest has met with the wide school. But uh, this kind of interest-driven learning is, to me is really, a, sometimes it's a privilege. But as a system, you are trying to engage most of the students. How can a school to, to meet with all the interests of all the students? I think that's a that's a fundamental gap we are we are we are yeah okay. So that's why we <coughs> answer how can school can give this kind of diversified personal interest? Can the school can really do it? Can system real really do it? So we don't know. <coughs> right, you mentioned about the maker's education require some mindset shift or even buy ins from the school. So, how would you address this if, let's say, in this con context, I would like to get a most important is to get buy in from the PL perspective? How would you think, uh, do that in school? And encourage you? So, we, which <coughs> perspective are you taking? Are you, are you like a school leader or something like that? Yeah, maybe school leaders as well as the school committee, HODs, and even teachers as well, the buy ins from them. I I guess part of it is like, you know, you've got to, you know, convince them. I mean, in the, well, here's the thing. Uh, the good old fashioned way of doing it is, uh, you know, okay, uh, you know, set up a committee and you get people involved and, you know, okay, these people have to learn about things and, you know, you uh, call consultants and, I mean, go, <coughs> I should do that. I mean, that, 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 I suppose, can work. I mean, you know, it achieves your KPIs and stuff like that. But I mean, there's always the, the, the problem between the, the, the quantity and the quality issue. I mean, as in like, you know, they may, uh, you know, look at what you want, uh, exactly your, what your KPI is, and give you, give you exactly what your KPI wants, is it? And that's what you have. But I mean, I, I think, you know, you, you, perhaps a better way to do it is to sort of nurture and allow for, you know, this, this, like, weirdness, this kind of messiness, this kind of chaos, right, to bubble up from below, rather than, you know, to programmatically, you know, make it happen. Uh, and and to, to sort of nurture uh, some of these, you know, weirdness. Uh, so for example, Kaniki Mellon University, uh, they, they have this thing called uh, First Penguin Award. What's that? Uh, so, uh, it's really funny. Because, I mean, if, if, you, if you see penguins behavior in the South Pole, uh, they will all huddle around a, an ice floe because it's safe. Uh, but, you know, if you're safe, you cannot eat. I mean, you need to go down into the water and feed on the fish and whatever. So, you know, after some time, right, the first penguin will jump into the water or get pushed off the like, most of the time by somebody behind. Get pushed off, goes into the water, struggles a little bit, and if he comes out alive, then all the rest jump in. But but if he goes in and he comes out, you know, the water is frothing and red, no, no, wait, everybody waits. So I mean, you know, you see, the first penguin award uh, award recognizes the individuals who take the, the risk uh, to to try 
you know, something new that is, uh, that is part of their passion. I mean, perhaps for schools uh, to institute something similar like a first penguin award, rather than, okay, I want you all to you know, do this. I mean, I, I don't think it's a uniformly good thing that you know, all schools need to oh, get onto this innovation bandwagon and you know, this is a new program, everybody needs to do it. And I mean, that, then, I mean, how are we different from what has been, you know, what has been done over the last you know, 40 years? I mean, I, I think you know, if we want students to you know uh, to be passionate, to be innovative, I think teachers need to model that, and, and you know the, the school organize. I mean, the, the leadership, the school culture, and, and the leadership organization needs to model uh, this ability for like recognizing passion where it happens. Uh, I don't want to be that first penguin, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk about. Um, Maybe uh, this idea of evidence-based research uh, from uh, library science. So a lot of schools uh, in countries such as the US where library teacher librarians are the norms, actually they are because of funding cuts, um, they actually schools try to do away with what they see as necessary roles. So there's a lot of advocacy going on. And one of the arms of the advocacy is the idea of evidence-based uh, research which any teacher can do, it essentially means that you need to determine what that space is being used for or what that innovation uh, is supposed to be for. So for example, if I say I want to see that the library has improved as a reading space or as a research space, I determine that these two are the two main components, then I'm going to draw my measures uh, to evaluate the use of that space. So you know I want to make d and in a certain way and you know, how is it, how am I going to gather evidence? Because obviously the grades are not going to be your short-term evidence. And in fact, there might be even a short-term dip in the grades sometimes when they are changed. So in the library research, at least when they talk about evidence-based, it's about knowing very clearly what you're trying to measure, coming up with um, um, the criteria for what you're going to measure, and then starting to measure it from the beginning. So when I work with teachers, I tell them, do a survey, talk to students, and gather all your feedback about what your library is like now. And then when you have made that little change to the library, then you know, one year later, you can do a survey again, or talk to more students, have focus groups, to try to figure out if you at least achieve that bit. Because um, schools are constrained. Some schools, like Commonwealth, they have a big budget. They're redoing their entire library. But most teachers that I work with, they don't have a lot of money. So the question, so it's about track of the evidence of what you're doing. And then when you have some success, then you can go up to the school principal and say, look, we've had minor success with this. How about if you pump a little bit more money and we can do something else? Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I would echo that. I think we just, uh, a good way to start might be to um, celebrate the successes and to look for uh, local champions within your existing school culture, because that was essentially what I was trying to get at. Uh, the champions can be found in the un most unlikely places, and they, not, they may not necessarily be the high achieving uh, students or your very motivated teachers. Um, um, that, that, would be one, that would be one thing. And um, I think the other thing I'd like to say with regards to this would be perhaps we can also start thinking about shifting the conversation away from making and fabrication. I, I really appreciate uh, Chini's presence here because uh, she's uh, giving us a very valuable perspective that actually um, our wider goal really transcends, uh, is, is too broad to, to, to be emplaced in uh, any particular subject area. Um, and. Um, Essentially, yeah, I mean, yeah, the, for example, to take the subject of geography now, uh, in geography there's geographical investigation, which is, which is uh, a, a very big issue with uh, job teachers on the ground. And a lot of us are grappling with it. But actually, in terms of geographical investigation and inquiry, um, the thought processes that one goes through in crafting an investigation and in carrying this out um, are very would be very similar to the thought processes uh, involved in a design experiment. Yeah. Any other questions? <coughs> it would appear that one of the things that we keep hearing is also this idea of the tensions. Um, 
between formal and informal contexts. You know, is it the case that we should leave it as a status quo in terms of the current climate and the current uh, learning environments that we have now? Um, or should we be doing more and where we should we be doing it? Leave it as it is. Uh, students have CCAs after all. Um, they have informal learning environments outside of school as well, which most of us don't document. Um, but is it status quo? Is that a good thing? Uh, okay. I think we just mentioned about coding. And uh, we know that uh, this kind of uh, computational thinking will be a national curriculum in the future. So I think that's a case when uh, I think that's a case when the informal learning has really comes to the scope of formal learning. I think that's a that's a that's a very good example. Um, but uh, when we when we try to observe all those uh, CSA. Uh, Activities. We don't think that every CSA activity can really be kind of be converted into this kind into this kind of formal learning patterns. So, so I think to me it's like it's it's good to have this kind of coexistence of both uh, formal learning and uh, informal learning uh, elements. Even we can see that based on our observation, especially in this kind of school settings. Both formal and informal set elements are co coexisting, co are coexisting in certain scenarios. We cannot distinguish very, uh, very clearly about uh, what is, because there's still teacher instruction, there's still kind of uh, student creation, there's still kind of <coughs> uh, individual uh, exploration. Okay, so all the elements are actually coexisting in, in schools or even in the, because because this kind of formal and the, when we talk about formal and the informal is it's really about crossing the boundaries okay crossing the boundaries of school home library okay so this is a this is a new new learning already and uh, we know that the system is trying to provide support to this kind of uh, we can call it as the learning anywhere, learning anytime. Okay, it, it's okay. I think it's we can <coughs> we can just live it. We can try to, but uh, but uh, but in the challenge is the challenge is how is still about what we can learn from the informal learning and try to influence the falling learning part. I think that's what that's what we are trying to do because. In this kind of informal learning part, we see more student creativity, innovations. Okay, while this kind of student-centered learning has been happening, happening more in those informal settings. How we can learn from this part, and then try to use it in the informal part to, to the formal part. Uh, there's a question at the back. Uh, on Jeff from, from NIE, oh yeah, I did that. <coughs> kind, of, kind of a comment and maybe a, a question following. Uh, what first is uh, so learning? Can, can we say that learning uh, can both be interest driven and non interest driven? And, and uh, in a sense, okay, and in a sense, informal space are more prone to interest based driven learning and, and Informers, uh, informal space are, are better at uh, non-interest driven learning. So Kyle, we see, we see the strengths of, of both and what you are kind of alluding, alluding is perhaps both sides can learn from each other. Uh, and maybe the question is, CCA, is CCA considered informal learning? And if CCA is uh, to be graded and has an impact on so-called you know, high stack uh, assessment towards the next level of education, is a greater CCA formal or informal learning? Are there, are there consequences if you start to grade and make CCAs a high stakes? Yeah. Is that really good? Yeah. Is that really good? <coughs> so my just uh my, my response to her just uh, uh I think very important <coughs> is that um 
Okay, I got distracted. Okay, um, let's see. So, what are you asking about? Um, okay. When for I think is really for my time. <laughs> I, I okay, so I just want to, I, I, I don't I don't really like this you know formal informal distinction because I think it, it sets up an artificial dichotomy or like like you know like o almost to say like you know it, it, they're kind of thinking like oh formal equals boring uh, you know just hard work and informal is fun you know kind of thing and uh, I think there's there's a, there's a problem with that I mean you know we make we make it sound as if like you know the the stuff that is informal education the stuff that you know gets you your grades and stuff uh, is more important. The informal learning, you do it informally, and you know, you're just going to have time. <coughs> uh, the problem is this: um, I think you know, increasingly, you know, uh, with great inflation, uh, you know, even a, a, a school like MIT is no longer accepting people who have like you know perfect degrees. If you don't have like you know, perfect uh, scores, if you don't have a good you know uh, making portfolio, so they are most competitive engineering. Uh, so if you have never touched a screwdriver, if never like cut something. Uh, never made something, forget it, don't, don't apply to MIT, you won't get it. Uh, the, the quote that I wanted, I mean, you know, that I just, I, I didn't manage to, you know, emphasize during the, my presentation was this. Um, Ken Robinson, I'm sure everybody has seen this before. If you think about it, the whole system of public education around the world is a protracted process of university entrance. And the consequence is, is that many highly talented, brilliant people, brilliant creative people think they are not because the thing that they were good at at school wasn't valued or was actually stigmatized. And I don't think we can afford to go on that way. And I think that, you know, it's something that, you know, we have to, you know, bear in mind very much. I mean, we, in, in, uh, in like, focusing on, like, you know, uh, school rankings, in focusing on, like, you know, PISA rankings and, you know, in, in focusing on the, the, the KPIs, we miss out on, you know, a lot of other things, a lot of other ways in which people can be creative and innovative. I mean, you know, we, we are no longer talking in terms of how creative are you, but we are now talking in terms of how are you creative. And I think that that, that kind of mindset shift you know, needs to be uh, more global, more more widely recognized. Yeah, I remember my point. Thank you, Michael. So this thing about creativity is very fuzzy. And I think if you ask a room full of 28 people, you'll probably get 42 different answers on how to define creativity. So basically, I, was, I just wanted to say that I think um, domain knowledge, deep disciplinary knowledge, and creativity go hand in hand. So um, you, you can't, just, just, just like Long Kai's uh, very excellent uh, three-step ladder, he wasn't trying to uh, speak pejoratively about the lower parts of the run. But basically, he was trying to make the point that in order to get to the higher parts, you first need to slog through the lower parts. I think that's what you wanted to say, right? Yeah. So likewise, um, I think you, uh, I think we do need the deep disciplinary knowledge which comes from formal curriculum in order for us to then that thereafter have the the the, the creative spark. But Chini's excellent point is also that do we have is the time, it, it also needs, we also need time and space to be created for this. Because we can have very brilliant people, or we can very, not so academically brilliant people, but creative people, but if they're not given the time to reflect, to fail, then they'll never be creative. Yeah. Uh, just to add a little bit, I mean, it's, it's um, probably an academic disagreement. It's, it's not true that, uh, that that you have to be like you know uh, 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 schooled in the disciplinary knowledges first, and then you have time to be creative. I mean that that is a very you know traditional way of like oh creativity is a, you know that part of the uh, you know the the order high order thinking thing in the, that you know uh, yeah is 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 this. It's, it's this harmful notion that oh uh, you have to work on your basics first before you become creative. Uh, it's it's not that it's not one or the other. It's not like linear in progression. I mean, and it doesn't also necessarily mean that you know pedagogically speaking, right? You cannot approach it from an uh, interest-driven perspective by uh, giving them a, a project with which they are, you know that drives their interest, and then you know encourages them to look uh, uh, deeply into the the matter to discover. The formalisms um, for them. I mean, so not not necessary for them, but by way of like you know, uh, 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 like 
you know, a, a concrete experience first, okay, before understanding the formalisms. In other words, if I tell you about, say, for example, uh, Newton's laws of motion, you know, the first law is what, so and so and so. I mean, the traditional way of doing it, you know, in, in, in physics instruction, uh, tell you that, oh, Newton's law of motion is this, and then, you know, you memorize the equation, and then you, and we'll go, we'll go do a lab, and then you figure out, oh, okay, then that's what it means. Uh, it, it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean, that, that isn't necessarily the best way to do it. In fact, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, <yeah. laughs> in fact, a lot of times uh, 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 we've, we've come to know that, you know, grounded experience is very important um, to uh, the, the deeper appreciation of the formalisms. Um, um, I misunderstood my point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that both of you were talking about practice. Uh, you know, in order to do at something, you need to practice at something. And I'd like to think about the issue of a school being able to evaluate itself in terms of, rather than thinking about the formal or informal, the larger question is, if our school is a school that encourages creativity, what evidence is there of creativity in my formal curriculum and in my informal curriculum? So you could have a stage one thing where in your classroom, and I'm talking about my son's P1 classrooms, they have like, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but you know, teachers come in and they do like um, creative games with them, story cubes and things. So there's a program going on for the general crowd, okay, to encourage them to be creative. But there's also honesty of the mind, right, for those who are interested and who want to take it further and who are willing to spend that extra time. So I think it's about evaluating the school culture and sort of just taking a broad look and say if these are the dispositions that we want to encourage, uh, what kind of practices are going on at the different levels uh, to encourage these things. Okay, um, one final question and then we have to wrap up. I think the question I, I wanted to add to comment to Kenneth's, which is, you know, um, I do agree with, with part of this point that you know, expertise in a domain or a debt adds a lot of value and it doesn't hurt to have and fundamentals have a role to play and also I agree it doesn't have to be linear but I think fundamentals go further we also have heard about David and Everton and people like us you know the, the, uh, the art of practice and things like that it's just a continuum we are talking about and the continuum could be uh, you know a graph which is up and down or any part of it and, and not to mention the point about, we're talking about 50 some, something entrepreneurs. The fashion used to be you're a college dropout and you're back <coughs> It doesn't have to be anymore. And the 50 something entrepreneurs have years of experience in the field that they have done, whatever domain it is, leadership and all qualities, then become innovative. So which means you have built some depth. So it doesn't hurt to actually gain domain knowledge and fundamentals, which is part of uh, getting creative. Because you know the fundamentals well. Later you can develop. You have something to, I mean, it also has, but, but that's a gray area. You have both. It's not either or the, uh, one or the other. But, but uh, you know, just wanted to add a comment to this piece that DI yeah, does have. Uh, thank you, Uma. So we have heard from the speakers today about um, <coughs> innovation and education for innovation. and how a number of dispositions are important for innovation, uh, as well as the nature of interdisciplinarity, the nature of the task design, um, resources and support that's needed for schools, the kinds of tensions that happens, whether it's formal or informal, uh, the importance of space and design about spaces. I mean, these are issues that educational researchers tend not to think too much about. Um, the importance of social environment Having a diverse or diversity of interests in schools, I think, is increasingly important as well. Um, and celebrating failure, the, the first penguin. You know, too often people are penalized for failure, and now I think there's a need, especially if you want to become a little bit more innovative, to be a little bit more uh, open to failure and to risks. So uh, I want to thank everybody for coming today. And um, we'll have a number of other uh, sessions and semi uh, discussions about innovation as we proceed along. Uh, and thank you very much again. Yeah.